Hey everyone, welcome back to another Ask GN. This is the third one we're shooting for this series of them for, for this week. The bonus episode will be on patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll have another one on the main channel. And we're traveling internationally for the NVIDIA event and for Gamescom, which is all public at this point. So uh, we'll be traveling for that. After that, you can expect a lot of news and other tests and things like that as we finalize our move into the new space. So we should have some actual benchmark co content coming out aside from the case reviews we've just published. But anyway, as always, leave your questions for next episode in the comment section below if you have them. We have a couple good ones for this week, so we'll get through those and hopefully you can post some good ones maybe about the Gamescom announcements in the comment section below for the next set of episodes. Before that, this video is brought to you by the EVGA CLC 280 liquid cooler. People ask me how I keep cool during the summer with all this hair. Well, I've tried a lot of different products, and few do exactly what I need. Many of them cause tangles or worse. EVGA CLC 280 helps keep my core temperatures low during hot benchmarking sessions. The CLC 280 is price competitive and focuses on performance for value, offering a 280 liquid cooler at an affordable price. Get yours at the link in the description below hair mounting kit sold separately. So first note before starting, these are back in stock. The GN beer glass in cobalt blue with a gold trim around the edge. It's on store.cameraznexus.net. If you wanted them in the first round and they sold out because they did very quickly, we now have them back in stock on the store as well as the mod mat. Still a, a couple of them there if you want to pick up a mod mat before the next round, at which point we'll be waiting for uh, the shipment to come in. So the first question for this week, is from GGCHB Gig GHP, who says, Steve, how much does corporate spying or personnel buying happen in the hardware world? Can struggling fabs or manufacturers just hire someone from a successful one and get all the secret techniques? That's a big problem and a big concern. And there are a lot of very uninformed comments in reply to this question. So uh, corporate espionage in the PC world happens all the time. Theft of trade secrets happens all the time. We talked about it in a hardware news episode kind of recently where I think it was the Wall Street Journal had this huge feature piece on corporate espionage, theft of trade secrets, theft of intellectual property between fabrication plants, specifically between memory suppliers and memory manufacturers. So extremely common. And uh, as far as can you just hire someone and get all the secret techniques, some of the comments below yours talked about there are NDAs. Well, yeah, there are, but that doesn't really stop anything. I, ideally, uh, it would, but that's not how the world works. And of course, you can also sue anyone who you want. Anyone you want doesn't mean that you're going to be successful in it. In these instances, because a lot of this stuff is international, it kind of depends on where the different parties are based, whether the lawsuits are successful for intellectual property theft and stuff like that. So I want to go through some of the stuff I talk about in that hardware news episode, just in case you missed it, be a bit of a recap for those of you who saw it. But uh, one of the things we talked about was there are instances in the, uh, I think it was again, the Wall Street Journal article. Uh, they talked about instances where China-based companies were stealing intellectual property from Taiwan-based counterparts in the same industry. And there have been several recent lawsuits that actually put people behind bars for stealing uh, information from one plant moving it to another or from one manufacturer moving it to another, particularly in the semiconductor space. So very common. And a couple of these examples, so there's Shanghai Huali Microelectronics Corporation, which infiltrated TSMC, or Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, which many of you are likely familiar with, as they make a lot of the parts that we use in, in our end of PC hardware. Uh, so the Shanghai Huali Microelectronics Corp infiltrated TSMC, and in doing so, they were able to illegally access, quote, reams of trade secrets. Uh, so big problem there. The employee who was implicated in this corporate espionage was sentenced to a suspended 18-month prison term for IP theft. And recently, also, Micron's been in the news for a lot of the same stuff, where Micron had an engineer who was recorded by UMC, uh, the company, the very same one, that just had a preliminary injunction placed upon it for uh, placed on Micron in China. And that engineer has now been indicted on charges of trade secret theft. And uh, as he moved from Micron to UMC, taking those secrets with him. So uh, very common. UMC is a Taiwan based competitor. In this instance, the illegally taken documents were used to design chips for uh, a different company, which we talked about in the hardware news episode. And it's a Chinese semiconductor company called Fujian uh, Jinhua. And that's a circuit company. Nanya, which you may know for 
being the smallest of the NAND makers and DRAM makers, uh, they make a lot of the caching chips that go on SSDs. So Nanya recently sued one of its engineers for supplying manufacturing photographs to another competing company. And uh, that one was one that Wall Street Journal reported as being China's largest state-owned chip maker. So it's very common for IP theft and, uh, and trade secret thefts and things like that to occur in this industry. And no, NDAs don't just stop it magically. It's not really how people generally try not to get caught. And if they don't catch you, then an NDA doesn't really matter. So uh, very common. Great question, though. And that, um, that, that article that we talked about in the Hardware News episode previously is a very good read if you're curious about that stuff. It's, it's very interesting. Uh, very interesting content to read through. Next one, Qlum, or Clum, who says, why do cheaper motherboards often include outdated connectors long gone from their more expensive counterparts? For example, the ASRock A320M DGS, a bottom-of-the-barrel motherboard, has a COM and a printer port. It clearly costs money to solder the connector, yet it is only included in the lower margin cheaper motherboard. Being cheaper doesn't mean it's lower margin necessarily. but uh, so. We've talked about this before, but when we last asked the motherboard contacts we have about this, motherboard makers have in the past told us that a lot of this depends on the region they're targeting for the board. So legacy ports make a lot of sense on boards that are being sold in manufacturing heavy regions like China and Taiwan, where a lot of the machinery that they use is still hooked up via something like COM and they want that port there. So last time we asked about this, it was sort of a ton in cheek, like, why is that there? But uh, it was a good answer, and, and it was because their customers in other regions do actually need those ports. So that is a, a big consideration. A lot of the factories still run on older I.O. interfaces. Uh, serial com are also very useful for debug, and sometimes it gets left on there. I don't know if it's just cheaper or what, but um, another example is in uh, the rapid, uh, what is it called, pick and place machines. Those. I don't know if they sort of spool it up for something and then they just keep putting them on the boards because it's cheaper to rearrange everything than it is to pull the common serial stuff out of there. But either way, it seems like the region-specific stuff is more of the consideration last time we asked anyway. And that was a, a couple of years ago, but same idea. Kobe Ricky said, can too many case fans actually make your PC cooling worse? Yes, definitely, especially if they're not configured in a good way. So. Uh, this was, a good example of this would be something like even the Half X, an older case that was pretty airflow focused. Putting fans in the top in the wrong orientation, it could be intake or exhaust, will definitely hurt your performance. You start ending up with vortexes forming sometimes where the hotter air will recirculate. So the Bit Phoenix Enso is a good recent example of this that we showed where because the front panel is completely closed off, the fan actually the fan mounted to the front because it can't get access to air from outside it actually ends up pulling air in from inside the case so after the air has been warmed up and generally blown out of like the gpu or the the back of the cpu cooler although generally that more of a radiative heat issue off the back of the video card it's pulling air from there because it can't get air anywhere else so all the pressure is just it's sucking air forward through the case up into an intake fan and getting pushed back into the case. And so having a fan too high up in that area, the front of the case, the Enso, did end up with much worse thermals. And that's an example of where, where that can occur. Uh, also, if you end up doing something like, again, top exhaust. So let's say you want to fill all your fan ports, or at least the ones on the top, and you have maybe three intake and three top exhaust, something like that. The exhaust towards the front of the case, if it's a tower air cooler, will steal more air from the front intake than it will help with getting rid of warm air. So if you think of this as the front of the case, this is the top, air comes in and it gets pulled out immediately as it enters, so it never makes it to the CPU tower cooler. Uh, typically for exhaust fans on the top, if you're going to have them, we like to have them behind the CPU cooler because that's where the warm air is, not in front of it because it doesn't actually help unless you really need some pressure to pull the air in. Maybe if you have a bottom intake, you need some pressure at the top to pull the air up and through the cooler. But otherwise, that's a pretty uncommon scenario except for like the RV, RV O2 or something like that. Definitely too many fans. Can make cooling a lot worse. Next one, Nori said, what is the one downside, as if there is one, of moving out of the GN lair and into a commercial office outside of paying for a lease and moving? The moving's actually been an upside because it's allowed us to 
uh, rearrange things the way I want from scratch rather than have to work within the confines of stuff that's been there for a decade. So that's actually been an upside. So as doing inventory, stuff like that, so we know what we have and uh, give some more content ideas, things like that. I've had a lot of content ideas come out of the move because I've seen all this stuff where it's like, oh, yeah, we have that and that would be really cool to do something with. Uh, downsides, probably uh, internet's a bit of a downgrade. It's not that bad. So, well, it's bad in terms of price, but it's not as bad in terms of the upload download. Uh, we can't get as much upload download. I have gigabit for residential and that's significantly more expensive for commercial. Uh, so a bit of a downgrade there. Fortunately, the server side of things like YouTube does bottleneck anyway. So if residential is a gigabit, the most we ever got out of YouTube was 300 megabits up, which is a lot, but it would tend to average closer to 200 or 250. Uh, so you don't, you know, having a gigabit unless you're pushing uploads to multiple servers at once, it didn't really matter all that much. Uh, it's really a couple hundred megabits you want ideally. So internet's probably the biggest one though. And then uh, David asked, there have been a few videos where you said you were specifically not under ND any NDA, and Linus has also said that in a few instances. <clears throat> of course, you can only speak for yourself, but are there are you actually honest about that, uh, or would you say that exactly because the NDA doesn't allow you to talk about it? So when I say we're not under an NDA, it's honest because there's no reason not to say that. If we're not under an NDA, there's no obligation not to say that. If you're under NDA, you either don't address the question or there's specific language in the NDA that says what you can and can't talk about. And it doesn't make any sense if you're under one to say you're not under one. Uh, it makes more sense to ignore the question or answer it in some other way. So yeah, if I say I'm not under an NDA, it's, it, that's accurate. Uh, generally, we're probably under some kind of embargo for something that most times, but you know, if you're specific with the question, then uh, if I'm not under one, I'll let you know. And I think Linus, same thing for him, based on the times I've seen him talk about it. But I can't can't speak for him, obviously. Modzi says, "What do you think about Nvidia finally changing the GTX branding on select new models of GPUs to re to GeForce RTX? I feel we've been stuck on GeForce GTX for so long that I'm actually really glad they're finally changing things up. Uh, as a note, I really do hope they at some point start read." restart their numbering system so we don't end up with five digit SKUs one day. And I hope they bring back the Ultra branding. Yeah, 8800 Ultra was a really good card and the last time I remember seeing that branding in any meaningful way. Five digit SKUs aren't gonna happen, I don't think. Uh, probably they'll restart the numbering just like they have done several times previously for all these companies. So I wouldn't worry about that. GeForce RTX versus GTX is part of Nvidia's push to make ray tracing the next big thing. They I, they've been talking about ray tracing for decades at this point, but uh, the company, it's NVIDIA, specifically brought up ray tracing, I think in a 2012 or 2013 keynote that I covered where Tony Tomasi, still at NVIDIA today, did a keynote and talked about ray tracing being on target for real-time rendering, real-time rendering of ray tracing by 2015. Missed the boat on that one, uh, but not too far off. So it looks more like 2018, 2019 will have some form of real-time ray tracing rendering. It's just, it's, it kind of depends on how many traces you're taking, how many samples you're taking. Uh, they're doing stuff like denoising to improve the performance. So depending on your definition of real-time ray tracing, it's kind of here. Uh, anyway, RTX is a further push by NVIDIA to make ray tracing the next big thing. And ray tracing can actually use tensor cores like what the Titan V has. So that's a bit interesting because previously you see tensor core and you just assume it's only for deep learning, machine learning, and nothing else, but it can be used for ray tracing. So might see some of those on the GTX equivalent cards, but not positive yet. We'll know more in the future. Uh, RTX is, I think, going to be a hard name to get used to for me because I've been calling them GTX for so long. GTX sounds better, but I guess RTX is what we're gonna call it if it's NVIDIA's new ray tracing targeted whatever they're trying to do with it. It's all just branding and the, NVIDIA is trying to establish ray tracing as the thing to be excited about because I guess you always need something new to be excited about with any new processor. Uh, if it's just it plays games better then I, I don't know, maybe that gets boring to them at some point. And then the last one, Demon Mitt one says, what are your thoughts on the recent Case Labs announcement that they are closing permanently? Pretty sad. We got in one of their SMA 8s, uh, like, I don't know, a couple weeks before that was announced. So they probably knew that it was going to close at that point, or we're getting close to it anyway. So we'll do something with the case. It'll, it'll be more of a post-mortem at this point. But 
Definitely, uh, Case Labs made high quality stuff. Business model was a bit rough. Everything is extremely expensive. It's meticulously made, and it, it's just, I don't know, you can't have a giant audience for that. I think they said they had 20,000 customers or something like that, which is pretty damn good. But uh, sad to lose a smaller and innovative company in the space. It's just, I, I think it, it was kind of a mix of things like the tariffs they claimed really increased their metal prices, stuff like that. I believe it based on what we've seen. So tariffs didn't help them. And then the business model in general was targeted towards pretty expensive stuff. And so your audience, uh, audience size will shrink over time if there's not a really compelling reason to, to buy that kind of thing. Because the problem with making products that last forever is that people don't buy new ones. <laughs> That's the problem Logitech used to have with their G5 mouse. And if, if it just lasts for years and years and you don't need to buy another case ever, then the audience for them is, is going to be somewhat, somewhat uh, transient. So that's it for this one. Leave your questions in the comment section below. As always, thank you for watching. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our GN beer glasses in cobalt blue with the gold trim or one of our mod mats or shirts. And uh, subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.